The era of Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain is easily the most disrespected and misconstrued era in NBA history. The foundation laid by the players that came before us is the reason we can enjoy the high level of play that we do today, and their achievements and feats should not be forgotten. In this video, I will rebut and debunk some of the arguments used by detractors of 60s basketball. Many of these arguments are not used as statements of fact, but instead used to denigrate players from the 60s. I'm Big Stall, and I hope you enjoy. Wait a minute, wait a minute, cut this shit. Man, what you gonna do now? What we gonna do right here is go back. How far you going back? Way back. <laughs> As we go a little something like this. Hit it. Number one, players in the 60s work part-time jobs outside the NBA. We're gonna start with a partial myth that players in the 60s had to work second jobs outside the NBA. You'll see what I mean by partial myth when I start explaining, but for now, let's go into the origin of this myth. This myth most likely started from a Bleacher Report article written in 2010 by Ethan S. in which he stated, Whereas in the modern era the NBA draws a larger pool of talent from around the country internationally because of the exorbitant salaries, this is not the case back in the 1950s and 60s. Salaries were small so small that many players held second jobs during the offseason to support their families, and the myth likely spread to a wider audience because of this video. Bill, Bill Russell went to 12. Don't talk to me about Bill Russell and that time. He was playing against oh. the corned beef king of Long Island. That's who he won his titles against. And then Oscar Robertson with his triple-double, he was playing against guys that were podiatrists in the offseason. The reason I said this is a partial myth is because it does in fact hold some truth. A select few players in the early 60s had to work jobs in the offseason to support their family. The reason this is a partial myth is because of the exaggeration of the number of players that had to work offseason jobs. The players that had to work offseason jobs were the 11th or 12th men on the bench. The league average salary for the NBA was $13,000 in the early 60s, while the average yearly American family income in the 60s was around $6,700. This means on average NBA players were making double what an average family was making, and by the late 60s the league raised minimum salaries even higher to make sure all players were well compensated. Number 2. Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain played against short white guys. Okay everybody, uh, I know you were expecting something else, but as science will tell you, people were a lot shorter 2,000 years ago. This myth is simply incorrect. It holds about as much truth as saying LeBron James played against short white guys because he played against Jason Williams, or saying MJ played against short white guys because he played against Danny Ainge and John Stockton. This myth stems from the fact that in the 60s it was normal to list your height without shoes instead of with them, and also because people have a tendency to confuse college basketball film from the 40s with NBA film from the 60s. Many players of the 60s were, on average, only about a half an inch to an inch shorter than the average player today when taking into account the measurements were without shoes. This chart, courtesy of Basketball Breakdown, shows the average height of players from the inception of the NBA to 2015. As you can see, the average height of players throughout the 60s was around 77.5 inches or 6'4 and a half. If you add an inch as players today do due to shoes, the average height will be 6'5 and a half. Compare that to the average height from the 2000s to 2015, which would be around 79 inches, which is 6 foot 6. This is of course a difference in height, but it's not as large as people may think. And it's important to remember, height and athleticism isn't everything. CP3 has been a top 5 point guard in the NBA his whole career. Isaiah Thomas dominated the league and was getting MVP votes just two seasons ago. John Stockton, Allen Iverson, and the bad boy Pistons Isaiah Thomas, these were all Hall of Fame talents that were right at six foot tall and not extremely athletic. Skill is just as important, if not more important, on the basketball court. Number 3. Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain played against weak competition. I could have included this with the last myth, but this topic needs more explanation beyond simply saying there were tall players back then too. This myth extends from the short white guys myth, and any level of research can disprove it. Here is a list of some of the centers Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell had to play against. Willis Reed, 6'9 for a comparison he is just as tall as Al Horford. Nate Thurman, 6'11, one of the best defensive centers of the time, for a comparison he is just as tall as Andre Drummond. Walt Bellamy, who measured the same height and weight as Boogie Cousins, 6'11", 270. And later in Wilt Chamberlain's career, he spent a few years going against a young Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who of course is one of the greatest centers of all time. 
All these centers were skilled, whether it be Willis Reed's jump shot, Nate Thurman's defense, or Bellamy's ability to finish at the rim. But the biggest reason for the toughness of Bill Russell and Wilt Chambers' competition lies in the fact that there were only eight teams in the NBA at the time. Even though there were eight teams, there was still an 82-game schedule, so Wilt Chamberlain had to go against Bill Russell around 11 times a year, same for Willis Reed, Walt Bellamy, and Kareem, and he would have to go against Nate Thurman six times a year. That's over half the season facing Hall of Fame talent at his position. Imagine LeBron James playing Kevin Durant and the Warriors six times every season, or the Warriors playing the Spurs 11 times every season. For the time, that's quality basketball night in and night out. Those were matchups you would always look forward to. Number four, the time machine argument. This is going to be less of a debunking and more of a rebuttal to perhaps the most frustrating argument for me to hear as an NBA fan. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, the time machine argument is whenever a fan says, if you take a player from the 60s and put him in the NBA right now, he wouldn't be nearly as good. This argument also works for other eras as some people nowadays have been saying, if you take Michael Jordan and put him in the NBA today, he wouldn't be nearly as good. The other way around is if a player from back then says of right now, if you take a player from right now and put him back in the 60s or earlier era, he wouldn't be nearly as good. You can hear this from some MJ fans saying LeBron James couldn't make it back in the more physical 80s and 90s era. These arguments serve no purpose other than to denigrate the older and younger generations. There is no accurate way to compare the old generation to the newer one or vice versa. The way players cross over today would be called a carry in the 60s. The way players back other players down would be a charge in the 60s. Dunking on other players was seen as disrespectful in the 60s and just wasn't done as often simply due from the fact that backboards could break and a backboard broke, there's a good chance the game might just end there. On the other hand, a player from the 60s dribbles would not be as effective in today's game. Guards from the 60s would need more shooting range in today's game. Centers from the 60s would need to be more willing to throw their weight around when backing players down in the post and simply dunk on everyone. Not to mention the fact that players in the 60s didn't have the weight training regiments, sports science advancements, nutrition plans, transport by private jet, trainers, salaries, the foul calls, and many other things that players today have and benefit from. It's best not to compare errors. As a fan, it's natural that we do it though. If you want to have a legitimate argument about a player in a different era in today's game, to do it this way. Will Chamberlain measures seven foot one without shoes. With shoes, he'd be around seven foot two with a wingspan of eight feet. Now let's just imagine a seven foot two athletic big man with an eight foot reach was about to be drafted. He ran track in college and actually ran the 100 yard dash in less than 11 seconds and had a high jump record of six feet, six inches. Don Stewart, SMU, clears the high jump at six, six and a quarter. Followed by basketball star Will Chamberlain of Kansas who matches the mark and wins the coin toss for first place. With his vertical leap being around 44 to 48 inches. And if you don't believe me, take a look at this clip. He has unbelievable stamina and would be able to play 40 plus minutes a game immediately. Not only can he jump out of the gym, but he is as strong as an ox, posting a bench press PR of 400 pounds out of college. That's more than Dwight Howard can bench in his prime. He has a plethora of post moves, fadeaway jumper, finger roll over short defenders, numerous fakes and counters. His only weakness are his lack of real shooting range and his free throw percentage. That sounds like a top three pick to me. The reason we should use this method other than the time machine method is because this comparison is more fair to each side. Older players would need to benefit from the same resources today that players from today benefit from, and that includes studying from those who came before. 60s players didn't get to watch film of older players because that technology didn't exist when they were growing up. Nowadays, you can open YouTube and have hundreds of hours of film ready to go to learn the game. This is the way to go if you want an unbiased, fair comparison of both sides. Number 5. Wilt Chamberlain wasn't a team player and Russell outperformed him in individual matchups. What was the toughest thing? for you playing against Wilt? You could not, I could never play him the same way two games in a row because it, it would not work. And so uh, through the whole time we played against each other, every game was different. And now we've come to the final myth of the video. I can understand how this myth came about. 
Michael Jordan has all the rings while LeBron has the number. <coughs> oh, oh, excuse me. What I meant to say was Bill Russell has all the rings while Wilt Chamberlain has all the numbers. More specifically, Wilt Chamberlain lost seven to eight playoff series to Bill Russell. But let's dive deeper into the story to see if we should really blame Wilt Chamberlain or if there were circumstances to him losing. After researching the ways Chamberlain lost to Bill Russell and the Celtics, I just have to say it's unfortunate. As I said earlier, Wilt played seven series against Bill Russell. Well, of those seven series, four of them went to Game 7. And of those four Game 7s, Wilt lost every single one. But the worst part is that he lost them all by a grand total of nine points over four games. So how did he end up losing this way so many times? As I said, it's unfortunate. Every time it wasn't Chamberlain's fault. In one of the games his teams didn't pass to him for the entirety of the second half. He touched the ball twice in the second half, but it was blamed on him for the loss. In another game seven, he sustained an injury with the Lakers down by seven. As the Celtics were one of the best fast break teams in the NBA at the time, he figured it would be better for the team if he checked out to gather himself. As the clock is winding down, he asked the coach to put him back in. What does the coach do? He says, the team is playing better without you and he doesn't put Wilt back in. The Celtics go on to beat the Lakers and once again Wilt is blamed. The Lakers fired the coach after the season was over for not putting in their best player in a Game 7 of the NBA Finals. Imagine Tyron Lue not putting LeBron in a Game 7 against the Warriors, or Stephen Curry hitting multiple threes back to back to back in the fourth quarter of the Finals and Steve Kerr taking him out of the game. The NBA world would be cooking the coach for mistakes like that. But since Wilt was the leader and the best player on the team, he caught the lion's share of the blame in the public eye. Being one of the biggest and strongest players at the time didn't really work in his favor for this instance. Being as he was so strong and so dominant, people saw him as being able to take over a game no matter what and win, even when he was not on the court for some reason. His third loss, Chamberlain put on a clutch performance by scoring his team's final five points including an and one to tie the game. But Celtics legend Sam Jones ended up coming off a pick and hitting a deep shot that won the Celtics the game. And finally, his last Game 7 loss to the Celtics came from one of the most memorable plays in basketball history. Five seconds left, Boston only has a one-point lead. Greer is putting the ball on a play. He gets it out deep and have a check field. Wilt's teammate makes a bad pass and they lose the game by one. Beyond the losses to Bill Russell, no one mentions how Wilt played for eight coaches in 14 years, including a stretch where he played for four coaches in five years from 1960 to 1965, or how in the 143 games Chamberlain played against Russell, Chamberlain averaged 29 points and 28 rebounds. That's double the points Russell put up against Chamberlain and quadruple the rebounds, including a 55 rebound performance, or how during the 1967-1968 season, Wilt led the league in assists with 702, which would make him the only center in NBA history to lead the league in assists to this day. That's an average of 8.6 assists per game, while having nights where he put up 22 points, 25 rebounds, and 21 assists. That's insane. Not to mention Wilt could block the most unblockable shot in NBA history, Kareem Skyhook. And listen to this, he was jumping that high at the age of 36 after coming off multiple knee surgeries. Look, I can go on and on about Wilt's statistical achievements, but I'll just leave this video off with a comparison that I believe is fitting. What most NBA fans today call LeBron James selfish for putting up amazing numbers but losing to the Warriors over and over and over. Would anyone say KD or Steph has had better performances than LeBron in the finals in the last few years? I don't think so. One team is a dynasty, the other team is a legendary player trying to do it all. Personally, I find the accomplishments of David more impressive than that of Goliath. Well, that's it for the video. I hope y'all really enjoyed it. I really like to hear the type of videos y'all would like to see at this point. Um, just, I've been putting up gaming videos, NBA videos, that type of stuff. That's what I'm really interested in doing. That's what I enjoy personally. But if y'all trying to see something else, I'm perfectly fine to hear what y'all want to listen to or what y'all want to watch. Anyway, I'm a Big Star. Hope y'all enjoy. Comment what y'all want to see. I'll catch y'all next time. Peace.